الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. Um, we're emphasizing the point in uh, Surah Al-Baqarah. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, a house in which it is recited regularly, the devil will not feel comfortable there. He will leave. And what we said is, um, it probably doesn't make any sense if someone's very evil and they, you know, cheating, lying, stealing, disbelief, whatever it may be. If you just play Baqarah in that house, it doesn't mean everything will get good. So I think the intended meaning here is whoever was reading and learning from and following the guidance found in Baqarah, being the most comprehensive, detailed surah of the Qur'an, then that person will find themselves uh, uh, safe from the attacks of the devil. And that's where the house that is following these things, the devil will not feel like they can accomplish anything in this house. So this is, I think, the idea that we're talking about. So we're continuing Surah Al-Baqarah here. أَتَأْمُرُونَ النَّاسَ بِالْبِرِّ وَتَنْسَوْنَ أَنفُسَكُمْ وَأَنْتُمْ تَتْلُونَ الْكِتَابِ أَفَلَا تَعْقِلُونَ So do you direct people to righteousness and yet forget yourselves while you read the scripture? Don't you understand? So this, um, this ayah is basically, first, it is actually an immediate address to the Israelites of Yathrib, of Medina. Okay? So God is talking directly to them through the revelation uh, sent to the Prophet ﷺ. Uh, what he's reminding them is that um, if you're going to read the book and claim spirituality and a connection to prophethood and revelation, then it should start with you. It should begin with your heart and your mind and your character and your words, and then it should go out from there. So it makes no sense, don't you understand? Don't you reason to command other people um, that you are not doing it for yourself? So what has happened, and this is what we find, um, is that the Israelites, they got to a point where the elitists, the rabbis, amongst them, they knew a lot about scripture. They could quote it. They knew about the revelation. The common folk weren't so privy to it, but the rabbis and the elitists, they would command the common folk, but in many cases, they themselves would be above the law. They themselves would not follow the law. And that's the famous story in the Bible where Jesus comes into the um, uh, middle of the village and these people have basically given their witness that this lady is a prostitute and she has done fornication and all of this so they all picked up stones they're gonna stone her because obviously in the Bible that was a law and that was a historical law of the Israelites so don't let anybody convince you that this is something that Islam has invented and so then Jesus said to them, He who has no sin, cast the first stone. He who has no sin, cast the first stone. Meaning, you, guess how some of you probably in this crowd, as she is a prostitute, may have been with her before. And yet you pick up stones. You see? That's the idea here. And um, so that is uh, the attitude. So the Israelites, they actually are narrated in Surah Al-Ma'idah, it's very common. Surah Al-Ma'idah has many stories where some people will go to the Jews and talk to them and they will tell them, go to Muhammad. <laughs> go uh, learn from him. So particularly Arab pagans sometimes. So they would say, so you're asking me to go learn from him? Yeah, he knows. What he's telling you is the truth. Meaning, you, can, you need to follow him. He's got a good map. We don't have to follow him. We're the chosen ones. We have the holy truth. We're just walking truth. So, if you want to fix yourself, and that's the whole idea of Jews and Gentiles and the whole um, thing. Is that, oh, that person might benefit you. So, um, if you're reading scripture, uh, and you have knowledge, then that should be first happening with you. We said... No one will want to follow any religion. See, a lot of people think it's about convincing somebody. The fool will go around arguing with people about religion. Listen, this is what's right. 
this is the Bible said this, the Quran is that, and this is what it is, and here's what God is, and here's what Jesus is. You better listen, thinking they're going to somehow argue somebody into a belief system and away from their comfort zone and their cultural uh, convictions that they have. The Prophet وسلم, it was his example. If you look, when he met the people, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, after he had been given this revelation, he wanted to first break the news to them. When they said, وَأَنذِرْ عَشِيرَتَكَ الْأَقْرَبِينَ Warn your family, your, the, the Abdul Muttalib, these tribes in the Quraysh that are closest to you. Warn them. So he sent a message to them, I'll meet you at the Mount of Safa. So the Prophet ﷺ, he wanted to first introduce them to him as a messenger. He didn't say, I'm the messenger, accept it. He said, what would you say if I told you there was an army over there? They said, we'll get ready to pr protect ourselves and from this army. And then one of the narrations says, he said, why? And he said, ما جربنا عليك كذبا we never knew you to lie. Meaning, we can accept this from you. He was known as Sadiq al Amin. God doesn't just pick people haphazardly. He doesn't make them pious and righteous and put them in heaven. People are chosen for something in their heart that has inclined to Him, that has cultivated that. And so that's why Yahdi ma yasha. Yastafi yajtabi min ibadihi. He can. Uh, pick some people that are special. So that's where it has to come from us first. We have to be following it if we're going to teach it to someone else. If anybody's going to, you know, once my, um, I started this way with my own mother. I had been, you know, I, came, I converted. The first thing they gave me when I walked into a mosque was not a Quran, it was Ahmed Dida tapes, VHS, old school. Here, watch these. How to convert people. Yeah, yeah. This is the uh, missionary, the anti-missionary. So I go home to my mom uh, and I'm, you know, reading, I'm watching these. And I'm saying, see? She's like, son, I'm I have my own way of thinking, leave me alone. One day, she gave me a little motherly wisdom. She said, son... People aren't looking for someone to try to argue them to change their philosophy and their beliefs and all that. They're looking to see in someone something special. I want that. I want what that person has. I want... That person seems happy. That person seems like a nice person, like something that I appreciate. I feel the value of them. This is Rahma. Compassion, mercy, benevolence, kindness, gentleness, forgiveness, easygoing, concern, care, empathy, all those. That's what it is. When you see that, you'll, you'll want to be around those. And it's true. I mean, Buddhism really isn't much of a religion. But if you watch the Dalai Lama, the guy is a pretty interesting guy. He has some amazing skills of character and personality. A lot of people follow him because of that. That's the keyhole. For us, we have a creed. We have been given revelation that is telling us exactly why we're doing this character. For whom? For what purpose? But they will never want to know for what purpose if they don't see... They, want to know, they don't want to know the why unless they know the what. You see what I'm saying? So, the famous ayah... Protect yourself and then your family from the punishment of the hereafter. It doesn't mean you don't advise people. It's greatly displeasing to God that you would say one thing and do the other. What it means is you have to be consciously working on yourself. And people will appreciate that. Say you have flaws, and you're like, you know what, I'm wrong. So like, the parent who tells the child, 
Don't lie. Lying is evil. You should never lie. And the child has caught that parent lying many times. This is not going to work. So this is where you have to say, Astaghfirullah, you know, one time sh shaitan fooled me and I did that. We shouldn't do these things. It's easy. You, you will feel comfortable accepting that one. Because you see the source that came from is the right source. Abu Dardat, one of the great pious companions, radiallahu anh, he said, you don't truly understand until you are harsher on yourself than others in religion. As we said, he who has no cast, sin cast the first stone. So what it's saying is, is that, you know the old proverb, when you point your finger, there's three fingers pointing back at you. That's the idea, is that before you start telling somebody else about what's wrong with them, you need to be careful about yourself. A lot of people feel like religion is a matter of correcting everyone. Let me show you all what's the truth. Let me tell you all. Let me fix you all. Let's fix ourselves first. So how do we do this? وَاسْتَعِينُوا بِالصَّبْرِ وَالصَّلَةِ how, how do you do this? How do you make sure that you have grounded yourself and that you do not forget your soul? Tansona anfusakum. You don't forget your soul. So seek help with patience and salah. وَإِنَّهَا لَكَبِيرَةٌ إِلَّا عَلَى الْخَاشِرِينَ Undoubtedly, salah is a big task except upon the humbly submissive. So, as we said, this is related to the last verse. The last verse is telling us um, a reality of someone who doesn't make any sense spiritually. That's why the Prophet ﷺ, he said, الْكَيِّسْ مَنْ دَانَ نَفْسَهُ وَعَمِلَ لِمَا بَعْدَ الْمَوْتِ وَالْعَاجِزُ مَنْ أَتْبَعَ نَفْسَهُ هَوَاهَا وَتَمَنَّ عَلَى اللَّهِ الْأَمَانِ That the clever spiritual person is working on themselves, working for what comes after death. The fool is the one that's like, eh, inshallah, Allah will forgive me. So I have to be focused. So seek help, sta'inu. Seek help, seek assistance, aid on this Focus on protecting your soul with sabr. Sabr is not just patience. It's patience, perseverance, endurance, composure, self-control. The whole religion is patience. Sabr, you have patience to do the obligations. Because the person without a, a divine revelation saying you must do this, will do whatever they want to do, right? So you have to be patient on that. Realizing, I'm told I'm in a reality here that will be very short. If you ask people in their 70s and 80s, how long does it seem? It seems like just yesterday I was your age, and you're in your 30s and 40s. Uh, you think to yourself when you look at your kids, I can remember when I was 10, 12 years old. I was playing around with my friends, and there wasn't much of a purpose going on. It just goes like that. So, there are obligations. If you go into heaven, at no point will you be expected to wake up for a prayer or fast or, you know. Sim similarly, here you're told certain things that you will desire from your material self, your body, your mind. You should not do those because those are harmful to you. You won't realize it. You don't see it. You need to be told this by divine truth. So at this point, we're being patient on these things. But we know that if we go to heaven and we have followed that there is there there is no prohibition I said this once to the Sunday school kid so you mean we can eat a ham sandwich in heaven? you can eat a ham sandwich, it's halal at that point you need a nice clean pig food no problem there's wine there there's nothing wrong with that stuff there because here there's some flaws in those things something wrong with it that's why you can't eat it, that's why you can't drink it over there, there's no limits. Do whatever you want to do. Same thing. In this life, things will happen against what you would like. You will realize you are imperfect and you are not in control. Masaib. Bad things will happen. Don't try to be in control. Don't try to think that things will happen according to your will. Rather embrace the will of God. Embrace the knowledge of God, and know that no matter what happened, if I got K 
cancer, AIDS, my legs were amputated, I went blind and deaf, at some point I will die. And then I will embrace perfection. Because I am imperfect. And what we know, in this life, if I went through all those things, my sins are being removed from me. It was a good thing. I'm glad that I'm going through these pains here, so that I will not have that against me in the hereafter. There's nothing wrong with it. It's all good. How great is the reality of a believer? The affairs of the believers are all good. They understand the nature of patience. So, they say, al khas ba'd al-am. You feed a toki. In the Arabic language, specifically in Quran and Sunnah, the scholars have identified that when God or the Prophet sallallahu say a generality, sabr, and then a specific manifestation of that generality, salah, then that is saying out of all of the types of sabr, the most important is the salah. So, do not miss a prayer. You should feel like missing a prayer is like having your eye taken out or your arm chopped off or your mother or your child being killed. You should feel like you have lost everything because one prayer went by. And I knew it. I should have done it. You should never make any... So I'm at work, I'm at the office, I'm at school, I'm at the public, I'm in the mall. Well, I some strange thing. So my brother told me, he was like, what are you talking about? The fatwa is, women can wait till the end when they go out because it's haram for them to pray in front of people. This, this was said around here. Said, you can jamma Allah, you can do jamma for all of your prayers if you're out doing things out in the public, sister. Because you are, should be preserved and nobody should see you bending over. I've never heard any scholar ever say this. I don't see any ayah or hadith or anything that would indi indicate this. This is overstepping the bounds with culture. The idea of the woman... So now, what if she had to bend over to get the cereal off the bottom shelf? What does she do? Excuse me, sir. You have to come here because I'm Muslim. Who is this? So this is what we have. So famous hadith. إِذَا حَزَبَهُ أَمْرٌ فَزِعَ عَلَى الصَّلَةِ Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know how I learned this hadith? I was at Islamic American University. And I would call or visit one of my dear beloved brothers, Abdul Rahim. Abdul Rahim, MashaAllah, I love this brother deeply. MashaAllah, he moved, he moved to Saudi, he got a really good job there. And he wants his family to do Umrah. He's in Jeddah. Um... I always find him praying two rakahs. His wife always did. He's praying two rakahs. Two, two, two. So I'm like, Abdul Rahim here, he's praying two rakahs. <laughs> what the heck's going on, man? He told me, he said, anytime something happens and I start to feel bothered or stressed out, I know there's no reason I can just go pray. If I just pray, I can give it all back to Allah. There's nothing too hard for me, I just go pray two rakahs. I was like, man, what's going on, man? <laughs> you know, he said, that's just how I feel. And everyone, we're cool with that. That's how our house functions. So People pray in two rakahs a lot. Like an anger management? Not even anger. Somebody uh, calls with something, he's having a hard time with his uh, studies, anything. Something bothers you or gets you, you just go pray two rakahs. So, the Prophet ﷺ used to say, Arihna biha ya Bilal. Time for the ikhama. Bilal, call the ikhama, let's all be, let's just get peace in ourselves. Let's pray. That's the reality, the prayer. But most Muslims, says it, that's why it says, إِنَّهَا لَكَبِيرَةٌ إِلَّا عَلَى الْخَاشِرِ Most Muslims are like, the prayer is so much, can't keep up with it. Either. So, that's, that's the sadness. And what it is because they're not khashi'in. This is what the Prophet ﷺ uh, was. Deeply, humbly submissive and focused. Khushu'a khasha'a is like a state of... It's like a state of peace in realizing that... It's like it comes from sabr. In realizing you're not in control. You're not the greatest and the most powerful. 
and you don't have the ability to do this, you know. So, but all it is is that you know that there is one that is going to help you through this. So, you they say khushua, what does most people think? Khushua and salah is focus, right? So, I'm focused. The word has no linguistic meaning of focus. Khasha is, it is uh, humble. You know, like, you know, it's not about me. My life is not what's important. It's going back to the one who gave me my life. And I'm not in control. It's not, it's not my life. I've been allowed to have this. So it's a state of uh, realization of the greatness of God and what you owe Him. And that you'll never be able to... So if I pray, I have the peace of mind. He said, just keep the prayer up. And that's why yeah, some people they just pray really fast. And they just pray and they don't even know what they're saying. Routine. They say the same thing in every prayer. Are you aware that before the Fatiha, the Prophet ﷺ, there's at least that I found 12 different narrations that are either authentic or with a small weakness that the Prophet ﷺ would open up his prayer with this one. Most of the subhanakallah wa hamdika wa tabarak asmuka wa ta'ala. That's one among many. Allahumma ba'id baynana wa bayna khatayana wa bayni wa bayna khataya. Allahumma inni wajjahtu wajhi lilladhi. So forth. And there's many. Does it make it easy for you sometimes? Allahu akbar kabira wa alhamdulillah kathira subhanallah bukrata wa sallam. It's there. Very easy like this one. So there's many of these. In Ruku'a, the Prophet Sallallahu many, many authentic narrations, what he was saying in Ruku'a. And then outside of that, when he was asked, he said, somebody asked him, it's in Sunan Abi Dawood, Sheikh al-Bani said, it's a Sahih Hadith. He said, what do we do in Ruku'a, in the bowing, in the prayer? He said, فَأَمَّا الرُّكُوعُ فَعَظْلِمُ فِيهِ الرَّبِّ He said, all of you should be glorifying and exalting your Lord. He didn't say, with this statement. It's one time he said, Subhana Rabbi al and he said, and it's in the Qur'an that way. فَسَبِّحْ بِسْمِ رَبِّكَ الْعَظِيمِ It's there. Um, so that's where, when you're consciously choosing dhikr from the Prophet or you're making your own, it's much more spiritual. And that's why the best part of the salah is the prostration. You just... Uh, go down in the prostration and you just pray from your heart. Let it loose. It's like your mini Arafah. Mm-hmm. You've ever been Arafah? It's like a whole, it's like six hours of just praying. Dua. Mm-hmm. So it is right there in the prostration. And the majority of the scholars, yeah. Had in the Qamus here, uh, the Ah, so, submissive, humble, like that. Like, I give, I give up me for something else. And we know that's Allah Azza wa So that's what it is. So it's the majority opinion amongst the scholars that it is acceptable for you to invent your own supplication in the thing. And it doesn't matter what language you speak either. Because it's not a wahi. It's not revelation. Arabic isn't a holy language. Quran and Sunnah are holy statements that are in Arabic. Preserved for us. Some people got it the other way around. Hebrew is not a holy language. Although Orthodox Jews will bring the same stuff in there. It's the language of God, language of heaven, language of Adam and Eve. Is what the Orthodox Jews have said. Hebrew. Hebrew. No I'm sure if you were to talk to some Hindu people, the Sanskrit would be the original language of all truth and that's, that's just uh, we call that ethnocentrism taking the culture and the human, the worldly part of it that's why all language, that's why all religions go back to a place or a person mm-hmm. we need to remember Allah is above that Allah is not a person with a language so spirituality, you pray from your heart. الَّذِينَ يَظُنُّونَ أَنَّهُمْ مُلَاقُوا رَبِّهِمْ وَأَنَّهُمْ إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ 
Who are these people that have this humble submissiveness in their heart? That it's God that's at the center of my life. I have nothing. I can't do anything. He is my blessing. If I don't go back to Him, then I have failed in my existence. And there are those who expect to meet the Lord. Now somebody might say, in Arabic you say, Van, van yufidu shak. Ghaliban. لكن في الوحي اتفق العلماء على أنه قد يفيد اليقين. So, ظن is usually meant assumption, suspicion. But what it is, is um, here they naturally would expect that they are meeting their Lord. And their ظن here is actually a balagha an eloquence on the way they live. Not just something in their mind. They live this way. They expect to meet their Lord. And that they will return to Him. So, مَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُوا لِقَاءَ رَبِّهِ فَلْيَعْمَلْ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا وَلَا يُشْرِكْ بِعِبَادَةِ رَبِّهِ أَحَدًا It's the end of Surah Al-Kahf. It's telling you the conclusion. If you plan on meeting, if you hope to meet your Lord, then work righteousness. That will be the, the proof. And do not associate with your Lord any, anyone or anything. Our, our beloved brother Ali, mashallah, he's a Muslim Sufi rapper guy. He's in Minnesota. We'll bring him down here. Mashallah is deep. He said, the art of truly living is learning how to die. If you're going to really live this life artistically, beautify it, then you need to learn how to die. Meaning, you need to be ready to die every day. Then you're living your life properly. And life has meaning. And that's the famous ayah. Uh, وَمَنْ أَرَادَ الْآخِرَةَ وَسَعَى لَهَا سَعِهَا There's another one. وَمَنْ أَعْرَضَ عَنْ ذِكْرِ فَإِنَّ لَوْ مَعِيشَةً ضَنْكَ Whoever would turn uh, from his remembrance, uh, that person will have a sad life of nothing. You know, it would be bad life. We are returning to our home, the place of our inception. We are spiritual beings. When you're attached to the body and the things that the body and the mind want, then you're attached to something that will go away. It is worldly, it is flawed, it is fluctuating. If you want perfection, you have to go to the source of your life. And that came from heaven. So, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. So, in no word in the Quran or the Sunnah does it say, if someone dies, you're supposed to say that. Uh, what it's saying is, is that if any hardship or affliction happened to you, then remember that we belong to God and it is to Him that we will return. We, we're not our own. We don't own our lives. We don't earn anything, uh, anything else. Every one of us is His property. So He can do with His property what He wants. So whether it's our lives or the lives of those around us, Whatever has happened is, is expected to be right. That's rightful. There's absolutely no... وَلَا يَظْلِمُ رَبُّكَ أَحَدًا That your Lord is not unjust to anyone. إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَظْلِمُ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةً Crystal clear. He does not do injustice to an atom. The smallest of things. So the second somebody thinks... That's unfair. It's normal to be sad. The Prophet ﷺ was sad at the death of Abraham. Ibrahim ﷺ. This is from Al-Bayt Nabi ﷺ. His son. So, he started crying. Abdurrahman bin Awf or Abdullah bin Umar. He said, what is this? Because culturally, men don't cry at the death of someone. It's a man. I'm a man. Prophet ﷺ was sad, crying, tears coming down. He said, إِنَّهَا لَرَحْمَةِ إِنَّ الْعَيْنَ لَتَدْمَعَ وَإِنَّ الْقَلْبَ لَيَخْشَعَ وَإِنَّا بِفِرَاقِكَ يَا إِبْرَاهِيمَ لَمَحْزُونُونَ 
that I tears when you have a submissive humble heart that you are weak and you are not perfect and you don't understand the nature of things so it's natural to be sad people get sad but to become depressed is a whole different angle sad is to feel loss and to feel hardship and to say I, I wish you know things would be better you know but depressed is where you allow it to continue with you and bother you and get at you and your life is now ruined and your your thought process and everything is stopping because you can't get over it you can't just accept it that that's how it is and that's why I say inna lillahi wa inna lillahi. there's no depression for the one who truly knows what they're saying and means that at any hardship I have a question yeah, yeah. for sayings like this uh, we used to say it in Arabic and you are in a community where everyone around you is speaking English uh, it's recommended to say it in English it's an obligation because it's da'wah and it's it's وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا بِلِسَانِ قَوْمِهِ لِيُبَيِّنَ لَهُمْ It's, so here's where we're at. We have an ethnocentric vibe to us and there's this whole clash of civilizations uh, mentality. You know, the last great civilization that was producing like America and in, in Europe are now doing was the caliphate in Spain and Baghdad. That was the last time the earth had such great civilization. We have gone downhill since then, the last five, six hundred years, and getting worse and worse. And those people have come colonized our lands. And they're trying to change the identity of Muslims and confuse us in our religion. And so there's this standoffishness. Uh, but, and I, you know, people got have their culture, they feel comfortable saying it like that. And people are saying it like that amongst them. Fine. But to go around non-Muslims, and everybody's speaking English, and to say Arabic phrases and words, all you're doing is projecting that Islam is a foreign religion, and it is not compatible with their local reality, which is absolutely against so many things we learned about the Prophets in the Qur'an. The Prophets were all from their people, they spoke their language, they talked to the people in their language, and... Uh, that was something that was very important. Yeah. So we should do that. Um, if we are working for him, then we're working for ourselves. If we're working for ourselves, we're working for him. What that means is, as a spiritual person, we are um, engaged in realizing that my soul can only be whole and secure with Him. And so therefore I must work for His cause. And so I, I need Him. He doesn't need me. But in order to serve Him, I have to serve others. That's the story there. يا بني إسرائيل اذكروا نعمتي التي أنعمت عليكم وأني فضلتكم على العالم. O oh, Israelites, remember my favor upon you and that I have chosen you over all other nations. This is found in a few places in the Quran. This is talking about prophets, many prophets. There is no nation with prophets like the Israelites. No nation receives so much scripture. No nation receives so many miracles. No nation receives so much divine support for their military and kingdom establishment. So he's praising them before he goes into explaining some of their shortcomings. Some people perceive the, the um, charges the Qur'an makes against the Israelites as some sort of anti-Semitism. It is not. Any more than the charges the Qur'an makes against Muslims, which it's in there, is not anti-Muslimism. It's just correcting flaws. Taking examples of how people have gone wrong, Muslim, Christian, Jew, atheist, pagan, whatever, saying, here's some attitudes and practices and lifestyles and beliefs, but here's the harm and the problem in those. So we should not do that because this is what could be the end result. This was the, so it's just teaching us. He called them uh, uh, from the Jewish community in their history a nation of people guided by the truth and they are just with their judgment. Those people still exist till this day. 
I've met so many amazing Jewish people who are honest and just and stick to what they know from the guidance and they say things that are not popular with many other people because they know that's, that this is what's pleasing to God and that's their concern. And then another one says, Bima sabaru. Their patience. Surah to the sajda. So God praises the Israelites and the great things about them and so forth. Some commentators, they said, it's specific to that time. In their time, they were favored after uh, they were not. I disagree. The way I see it is, the Jews still are favored among all the people. In worldly things. Huh? I mean, you just see them. They're at the top of everything. No matter what they do, whatever what category they're in, they're a small group. And they're always at the top. No, but they weren't like this, for instance, at the time of Rasul Fasana. Oh, no, they were. No, in Jerusalem, they were... Oh, no, no, but that's... that's uh, we're not talking about that thing. We're talking about, in general, like, for example, if you were to say... Um, in uh, Yathrib, when the Prophet saw some of you would say, who has the best business? You'd be a, a list of Jews over the Arabs, and they would all admit it. And that was how Nifaq was cultivated, because they were concerned about their business dealings. And so, um, historically, this is the, the, he has blessed them with worldly favors, manna wa salwa and all of that. It's still coming to them, from many ways, from many angles. That is not just you know, oh well, because I love you and now you'll be ultimately saved because I love you. It's saying, look, look at all these favors. Who gave you those favors? Were, look what you owe. They were, I mean, I would argue that they were, they were famous also in the Rimba, right? No, they didn't do a Rimba amongst themselves. Well, look, but that, that's how they built the wealth, by doing a Rimba to the other, to the other nations. But it's not just wealth. I mean, if you say, show me all the directors or producers or comedians, anything it is, you will see Jews at the top of everything. 95%? Yeah, yeah. They, 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 whatever category it is, you will see Jews at the top. But I, I'm, I don't know. I wouldn't say it's because of my family, they are favored. But maybe because they are, they support each other. So you have two different angles. Uh, some anthropologist, a secular scientist, would say they have this idea that they're the chosen people. So it's that psychology and they help each other to it. I'm a Muslim, so I go to the Quran. Why is that? It said here, I have faddamtukum ala al alameen. It didn't say, ila ajalim musamma. It said, huh? this is how it is, you know, uh, from the day one until now, I see it like that. And this is an opinion, my opinion, by the way. I'm not, I'm not trying to tell you, you must believe this. I'm just telling you what I see. Yeah. So, uh, it could be. But, uh, that's what, I mean, if you read Mein Kampf, Hitler was very concerned that they were taking over Germany. Yes. Yeah. Who's in Mein Kampf? Let's forget that. That's the Nazi doctrine that says they're Qur'an. <laughs> this is the Nazi Qur'an. <laughs> yeah, is, he wrote that one. So, um, the greatest nation are those كُنْتُمْ خَيْرَ أُمَّةٍ أُخْرِجَدْ لِلنَّاسِ تَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوبَ تَنْهُونَ عَنْ الْمُكَرْ So, there's a difference between a nation that has been blessed and tested with things and the nation that is actually the best nation. It doesn't matter how rich I am. I could care less about that. It doesn't matter if I'm the best at whatever I do. It matters that whatever I do, I am pleasing God. If I'm doing that, I'm part of the greatest nation, if I'm part of a nation who sees it that way. What, it, a I, what I would say is, because you know, I have a lot of Reformed Jew friends, and I've had, with rabbis even, I get the feeling like, you know, the concept of God and spirituality for many of them is not as important than just being a good person to do socially what's right and so forth like that. You know, and so I'm not sure is there this deep feeling of we have to please God. Like, I get the feeling of good for good sake. You know? And that's because the concept of reform is to doubt all kinds of things in the scripture and its history and what it teaches and what the law has always said. 
That's what they mean when they say reform. MashaAllah. So the Prophet is completing the Abrahamic covenant. Why, why is this revelation coming to Muhammad as I'm talking about all this? People need to know that Abraham is the father, Isaac and Ishmael are the kids. That's where it all comes from. Here's where it gets down to the point. وَاتَّقُوا يَوْمَ لَا تَجَزِي نَفْسٌ عَنْ نَفْسٍ شَيْئًا وَلَا يُقْبَلُ مِنْهَا شَفَاعًا وَلَا يُخَلُ مِنْهَا عَدْلٍ وَلَا هُمْ يُنْصَرُونَ Beware of a day that no soul can benefit anyone else. In the least bit. There will be no intercessors accepted, no compensation will be taken, and they will receive no support. So, going back to your point, they support each other. All that money and all that support and all that power and all those skills will mean nothing on the Day of Judgment. That's what he's saying. He's saying, I've hooked you up. I've given it to you. And you have access to all kind of great things that no other nation has. But on the Day of Judgment, you can bring all that and it will have no value. So the Qur'an emphasizes people having their own account standing in front of God on the Day of Judgment with their own responsibility. So in the prophetic time, the Jews thought very highly of their power and worldly interests. And many people, other people have done that. Many Muslims are thinking like this now. Many Muslims. So like whenever it says, it says, غير مغضوب عليهم ورضالي It's telling you an example. It's not that all Jews, all Christians, all Muslims are one way and all of them the other way. There could be some who don't know about the Risala and they are an'amta alayhim because they're doing what they know is best. And they are purely worshipping God alone but they have a label of something else and they don't know. That's an'amta alayhim. That's what it means. And then there are some who are called Muslim and they, you see them right now. You see you in the world. People who are torturing, abusing, humiliating, and they're saying, I'm Muslim. Stealing all the wealth of the people, putting them all into, you know, the worst life. And they're saying, I'm Muslim. And if you, if they'll go Eid Salah and they'll go to the mosque and everything, it will look like, guy's got a Muslim name, talks Arabic. And then there's Dalim. Most Muslims are Dalim. I mean, let's be honest with ourselves. <laughs> they don't care, they're just, you know, whatever. Whatever I saw people doing, I, sometimes I do it, sometimes I don't, I'm not really praying too much. The rules, the Qur'an, the belief system is not the, all that deeply centered in their life. It's not like so important to them. The day of judgment could happen tomorrow, it's not on the top of their mind. These are, this is most people. The Qur'an is not trying to classify and judge groups as categorization of generalities. The Qur'an is saying, here's some qualities and characteristics that some people have been known for, some more than others, so don't fall into that. I think that's it. Zakamullah Khair. Yeah. The first time I was saying is that uh, Quran has to be with the Muslim now, first of all. No. At the same time, there's a saying by the Prophet ﷺ says, Balagu anni wa law aya, rubba mubalagin khayrun min samir. Oh. So the ayah itself doesn't mean that you do not, you don't stop preaching or telling people to do good, even if you are not doing it. Because somebody else could be doing it, even though you are not doing it. Exactly. Exactly right. So, we're not saying don't preach or tell people what's right. You have to do it the right way. And um, you should be concerned about yourself. But the one who doesn't care about themselves. Like I'll give you the prime example. When I came to know about Islam, there was a certain guy in Oklahoma. He does not pray. He did not fast from Allah. He is, you know, not living anything Islam lifestyle. Whenever I told him I want to be Muslim, he said, I don't even believe you'll be Muslim. He didn't like try to give shahada or nothing. Like this guy doesn't know nothing. He was trying to argue with me when it came to religion. But nothing. Everybody wants to say he's going to Jannah. Because he was the way that Allah is the way. If this guy doesn't fix his stuff, which after I kept going to the mosque, I invited him, didn't come, not even for Jamaat. Not even for Jamaat, this guy. Not even. They're like, but no, he's going to Jannah because all your deeds are in his scale. Was that his intention? It's not. So, we should all talk to somebody else, but 
we have to be concerned about ourselves first and we have to be sincere and, and trying to seek some divine reward and know when we're wrong. Like if we have to correct somebody that we're not doing it, we should say, you know, if, if they don't know about it, then you don't have to tell them. But if they know about it, you should admit it. But the Prophet Sallallahu he said a very strong statement to anyone who would just openly tell people their sins. That being said, some people get misconfused. Sometimes I'll talk about my jahiliyyah. Okay. Um, by the way, there is no authentic teaching that Omar uh, buried his daughter alive uh, and ate his idol. That hadith, la yasuh bihal, hadithun mawdu'un, ghir mawjud, laysa lahu sanad aslan. It's just something found in Sira books. Right? But some of the Sahaba did talk about jahiliyyah. Because he, he had a daughter also. That's right. Yeah, yeah. If you bring a daughter, why you <laughs> So, yeah, that hadith doesn't have any other It's just like people wildly like to say this one. Yeah. But, uh, but you can, to, for a lesson, you say, look what Allah has done to me. Now, after you're Muslim and practicing Muslim, you know, you don't say, oh, you know, I've done this sin. You know, that's private. Between you and Allah, who will remove it? Why would you, you know, the curse of God is the one who openly says, I've done these sins. Right. Now saying I have shortcomings We should all say like that So one brother said Imam You're supposed to be the Imam You came in the khutbah And you said I have flaws and shortcomings I have my own things I'm, I'm, Sins I'm working on Nobody wants to follow you now And I said <laughs> well, then Whatever they think about All the other Imams is a lie And if they're not saying this They've got something wrong with themselves That in and of itself is You know the last thing Anybody trying to teach something First one in Nar. I want to preach the knowledge service and look at the great scholar with the holy, you know, thing. So I blew my mind when I was in Egypt. I saw this guy giving a talk. And then he put his hand out for people to kiss his hand. What are you talking about, man? Come on, man. You're Benny Adam. We could go ask your wife if you should be putting that hand out. It's just so everybody, la, that dude's tripping. <laughs> Zakum Allah khairan subhanaka wa bihamdik ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik